This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past. The only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a fellow podcaster, Curtis Lonclo. Curtis is the host of the Retro Zest podcast. I discovered this podcast back in, I think, February or March of this year. Uh, Diane Franklin did a second interview with him. I had missed the first one, and she posted it on uh, Facebook. And I took a listen, and I've been drawn in ever since. This guy is very passionate about the 80s. And what he does on this podcast is he celebrates the milestone anniversaries of classic 80s movies, uh, occasionally a movie from the 70s, but mostly from the 80s. Uh, God, he's interviewed so many people I know, like Diane, Kelly Maroney, Sonny Carl Davis, um, Linda McClure, um, Rob Fahey of The Ravens, Gene Louisa Kelly, Rick Rosovich, Thomas G. Waits of The Thing, Heather Thomas, just a lot of people, and we're going to be talking shop basically today it's going to be a great conversation talk about the convention scene and everything he's based in i believe atlanta i know it's in georgia that he's based and he's a great guy getting to know each other a little bit on social media and it's going to be a great conversation so yeah here is my interview with curtis lonclo Hey, Curtis. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. Looking forward to being a part of Splat from the Past. How are you? I am just spectacular. This is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, absolutely. Well, the I mean, the pleasure's all mine. Awesome. So... You, of course, are the host of the Retro Zest uh, podcast, but long before you started the podcast, what were you doing? Well, uh, back in 2018, I started a blog. Mm -hmm. It was, and and the blog was on at Mm retrozest.com. And I, I started that blog because I was just looking for an outlet to discuss things that are of interest to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was inspired by some other retro uh, podcasters and so forth, like Stuck in the 80s, you know, uh, retroist, retroist shows like that. Mm-hmm. But um, I wasn't really at the point where I could start a podcast. Uh, so what I did was I started the blog and... I started a Facebook group, you know, attached to the blog. Mm -hmm. And what I began to do was I I started posting uh, birthdays of celebrities within the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, some anniversaries of movies and TV shows, et cetera. And started to get a lot of shares and a lot of likes on posts and everything. And started to grow the the Facebook group to, you know, a pretty large number, you know, around 20,000 followers. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic uh, hit back in 2020, May of, in May of 2020, I decided to bite the bullet and go ahead and start the podcast because by that time I was listening to, to several podcasts and I kind of was at the point where I could take things that I liked from each podcast and incorporate them incorporate them into my own. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I decided to do. And when I started the podcast, it was mostly a monologue of me just sharing random facts about movies and TV shows and celebrities mm-hmm. from uh from the past, from the mostly from the '80s, but some from the '70s and even the '60s, right. and um, I. But I eventually got to the point wherein I picked up an interview or two here and there. In fact, the first celebrity that I interviewed is our mutual friend Diane Franklin from yep. uh, 
Better Off Dead and from The Last American Virgin. Yep. And interestingly, I, I had never seen The Last American Virgin until right before that interview. I, I watched really? it and uh, was kind of scratching my head at the ending. But anyway, that's a that's another story. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, you know, was able to talk to her about that, and that was coinciding with the 35th anniversary of Better Off Dead. So we mostly focused on Better Off Dead. And then from there, I interviewed Melody Anderson, who played Dale Arden in, in the Flash Gordon film from 1980, uh, Lydia Cornell from Too Close for Comfort, one of oh, my favorite TV yeah. sitcoms of all time, with Ted Knight, of course. And so, you know, it just kind of grew from there, and it's it's to the point now where I almost prefer to have an interview on my show because it just makes it a lot more interesting than, you know, me just sitting at a desk sharing random facts but um and and, you know to be honest the reason that that i I started doing any of this to begin with is because i was tired of getting blank stares from my wife when i would share (laughs) random facts about films that were that we happened to be watching and you know she would turn to me and say you know i just want to watch the movie i don't I don't care about any of this. So, so I decided to find my people, you know, and that's basically what I did with, with both with the blog, with the Facebook group, and also with uh, the podcast, ultimately. Oh, yeah, same here, Curtis. I mean, I get a lot of blank stares from a lot of people. You know, I get very uncomfortable talking about my knowledge of film with, with ordinary people. You know, they just they look at it from a superficial uh, celestial eye and they just don't they don't know what I'm talking about you know and yeah I I don't I don't have a new take on anything so I don't like you know really sharing random facts out there unless I'm doing an interview so I prefer the interview part it's so much more fun it's so much more collaborative I, I just I enjoy interviewing I fell into this I never had aspirations of doing this but I've always been a kind of in- inquisitive person to like ask people questions. So I guess that's where it comes from for me. Yeah, and, and really the, the my in road with Diane Franklin with my first interview was the mm-hmm. fact that I had been to 80s in the Sand, uh, you know, three times, and she she kind of sort of knew me and I, and I understand that you you attended 80s in the sand as well I did not actually but I I know everyone who's involved in it <laughs> oh, okay I thought you attended I'm sorry no it's okay but 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 anyway um, that was kind of my end with her and then a, a, a lot of the others that I've picked up over time have just been basically trial and error and uh you know sometimes i get responses sometimes i don't um and you know i've I've gotten a few big name interviews like i I, my probably my favorite interview was with julian glover Mm -hmm. who played (laughs) who played the the villain in uh the james bond film your for your eyes only christados and he also was of course in the indiana jones franchise as as Walter Donovan right. in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and then also he played General Veers in The Empire Strikes Back. So he was, you know, <laughs> probably the most prestigious uh, person that I've ever interviewed. But, <laughs> I mean, I, I equally enjoy interviewing some of the more obscure actors and yeah. actresses because they, a lot of the time, bring a lot of facts to the table that the some of the big name actors, you know, either didn't don't know about or, you know, just weren't privy to at all. And uh, it's, you know, and, and, and besides that, I'm a big fan of obscurity and minutia as you are. Yeah. And I just like to, you know, let their voices be heard as well. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. The obscure ones are my favorite. I love talking to the journeyman actors because they got great stories and they don't worry about, you know, uh, saying something about somebody and their careers and all of that. There's just, it's so much more fun 
to talk to a journeyman, you know, but the icons that I have talked to, uh, I, I cherish. I mean, even though I didn't uh, get any new information out of them, it was pretty much the same interview they've done before, you know, it's, it's like they're reading a script, they're giving you stock answers. It's still great, you know, it's all great. I, I just have so much fun doing this. And Diane, yeah, she was my first guest. Um, I hadn't even met her yet, and she took a chance on me and said yes, and she's been on here a total of eight times now because I knew that when I started the podcast I wanted to be the Howard Stern of podcasters and that I had an interview every day it took a while for that to happen but once it did you know I've been running with it ever since and Diane she is just a, a treasure and I consider her a good friend wow eight times I mean you're you're six up on me I've had her twice <laughs> <laughs> I, I interviewed her uh, back in February, I think, because her new book came out about Better Off Dead, and yeah. that was uh, we, we, we were able to kind of build on the, the first interview, um, and I actually had another uh, guest host on that episode, Ken Pataki, but who was another uh, guy from Eighties in the Sand. But mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, Diane's great. <sighs> Yeah, she, uh, last time we talked was September of last year. She wanted to stop at number eight and graduate our friendship to unrecorded phone calls. So I I, I don't take that for granted, I tell you. Um, yeah, I mean, I oh, just... Good for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there's, there's many I get to have unrecorded phone calls with. But yeah, I mean, I discovered your show um, back in February or March when Diane had posted that second interview with you. And I started listening from there. Um, after I heard um, the Donna Schiller one, um, I reached out to Donna and we had a great conversation. And, you know, from there... From there, I've been listening to, to yours all the time. You know, I, I get excited because I can tell the difference from a person who really enjoys um, what they're talking about on a podcast and people who are just doing it, you know, for the clickbait or whatever. But I can tell that you're truly passionate about it. And I, I, I'm really enjoying it, Curtis. Oh, well, thanks so much. I mean, you know, Julian Glover, who, who I just was just talking about, he, he paid me a huge compliment at the end of our interview and said, yeah. you know, that he basically said, you know, thank you so much for a very thoughtful and interesting interview. He said a lot of the times these things are kind of banal and, you know, you basically start to roll your eyes at some of the questions that are asked and, and that kind of thing. And uh, he said, but he didn't feel that way one time. And, and I said, well, I said, it, it, it helps to be a super fan, you know, and, and and not to the point where you're fanboying all over the guest, <laughs> but, but that you actually ask questions that you want to know the answers to. Right. Uh, you know, and, and also... You know, ask them in a, you know, a lot of the time. Ask them in the way that it doesn't really sound like a question. It just sounds like a, a conversation that you're having. And then, right. uh, you know, you you say something to them like, "Well, I noticed that you were in this film, and you know, back in 1986, and uh, that you co-starred with so and so." And don't really mm -hmm. ask a question there. You just allow them to kind of elaborate on it, and uh, it's it flows a lot better that way. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I being that I'm disabled from a car accident, I have so much time on my hands, so I could listen to so many previous interviews uh, with a person to make sure that uh, certain questions haven't been asked yet, and it, that's a lot of fun. You know, it 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 makes me uh, it makes me um, you know just uh, realize that okay, my questions are are unique or what have you, and it's it's a lot of fun and. You know, I try to do that all the time now, but uh, occasionally I'll, for, I'll forget to go listen to somebody's previous interview and then have a really horrible interview because that person's n not a not a good person to talk to, you know, which could be unfortunate at times. And that's happened to me quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've had a couple of... Uh, I had one occasion where I was getting ready to interview somebody well i was i just about had the guy booked to do the interview and he was he was very interested and then i made some kind of an offhand comment about mm -hmm. 
obscure actors and films and how they have more interesting stories and mm. he got really offended by that and he really kind of took me aback and what? he said he, he said well he said you can uh you know and, and i in the process i had mentioned other people from this particular film that i was going to be interviewing for the episode mm -hmm. and he said well maybe you can talk to them about how obscure they are i i don't <laughs> Okay. I really don't have time to, to, to do that and, and kind of cut me off at that. And I I talked to his agent and his agent said, yeah, he said, don't don't worry about it. I mean, it, it was, you know, he was just being a little sensitive and maybe just misread what you said. But, um, wow. So did you talk yeah, to him? Sometimes you, you, you have to deal with some egos sometimes. Yeah. Did you did you Not end up interviewing him? Do I? Did you end up interviewing him? No, no, he cut me off. Oh, okay. He said, he said no. Oh my God, I wonder if I know him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so you, you kind of have to weed your way through some of that. But fortunately, most of the the people I end up talking to don't don't have that kind of an attitude and are are really, mm -hmm. you know, are really interested in having their voice heard. So. Uh, I've been very fortunate in that regard. Yeah, um, I've, I, you know, uh, out of, you know, I'm coming up on 1,600 interviews, and I've had maybe 17 jerks overall. I've had 98% great experiences interviewing people that I'm just so blessed to have. And, yeah, I mean, you, you have a knack for celebrating the milestone anniversaries of classic films and rock albums. And, you know, it took me two years to get rock musicians on here because they're a little bit more protected um, than actors are, you know. But but once I once I got all it took was one in order to get others, and like, have you found that so that uh, getting musicians is a little bit harder? Uh, yeah, I would say so. I've picked up a few here and there. I, I think one of the first ones that I interviewed was uh, Michael Baird, <laughs> who. It, 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 that's a real obscure one, but he was actually a member of Journey for a short period of time. He was oh, okay. He was never with them. He was never with them in the studio, but he toured with them on the Raised on Radio tour. Oh yeah. And we were celebrate. I was celebrating the landmark anniversary of uh, Raised on Radio. I think it was the 35th anniversary, and I was able to make contact with him through through another through through a journalist who had interviewed him and I, I reached out to her and said hey I noticed you interviewed Michael Baird uh, can, can you put me in touch with him or can you kind of point me in the right direction and she she contacted him and he ended up contacting me and uh, it was it was a great interview but um, yeah since that time uh, I've interviewed uh, Mike uh, Mick McKelly from mm -hmm. the band Europe oh yeah actually talked to him uh, you know, he was there in Stockholm, Sweden. I was talking to him in Sweden. That was a good interview, um, by the way. I like that one. Yeah, he was he was a lot of fun. A very 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 kind, a very very generous, and actually, you know, gave me an offer if they ever come to town to to have a beer with me. So oh, <laughs> I nice. may take him up on that if they ever make it to Atlanta. <laughs> um, and. Then uh, Doug Johnson, who was who was another keyboard player, the one from Loverboy, and most recently I interviewed Scott Page from Pink Floyd. He toured with Pink Floyd in yep. on the Momentary Lapse of Reason tour. I'm gonna hear that one and, today, uh, actually. Yeah, yeah, he's he he was a lot of fun. He was um, uh, it was kind of hard to get a word in edgewise. He was he, he was just so full of stories and information and. He kind of drove the, the whole interview, and it was great. And he yeah. um, definitely cherishes his time uh, with Pink Floyd. So that's there's my one degree of separation from Dave Gilmour, Scott Page. <laughs> <laughs> the ones who drive the interviews, those ones can be good. Sometimes they can just drive me crazy because I have so much to ask, you know. And sometimes... They won't. They won't even be saying what I want to ask, you know. And then I just, I gotta pick the right moments, you know. When they stop to take a, a breather, you know, it's it can, it can be tricky at times. Great example for me. I interviewed Brian Usna, who uh, you know was involved with Reanimator and all those 
you know, low budget horror movies, The Dentist, and all that stuff. I asked maybe four questions that whole interview and made like maybe two comments the whole way. And uh, we finished that just under two hours. I mean, he was just going a mile a minute about everything and i've i've heard interviews he's done since and he and he's and that's his style that's what he does you know oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah i've noticed that you know i mentioned that i'm a big fan of big fan of obscurity and uh, minutia i think you're even more of a fan of that because mm -hmm. some of your guests are even more obscure than mine oh yeah um, it, it's it, yeah I, I go for people who have never done podcast interviews. Their voices have never been heard, you know, and it, it was all incidental. I, n I never uh, set out to do that, but I've, I found a lot of people who were basically forgotten, you know, and they've thanked me for, for rediscovering them and finding them. It's It's been so gratifying. <laughs> I just, I, I, I can't believe, I, I can't believe it, you know, uh, God, there's, there's so many people, you know, and there's, just, there's people that I'm trying to get in touch with who, who, who aren't out there anymore and stuff, you know, like you remember Ralph Seymour? Uh, it rings a bell, but uh, just, who specifically is that? He, uh, he was in Meatballs Part 2, he was the Flash's, uh, buddy, uh, he was in Just Before Dawn. He was in Fletch with Chevy Chase. He was he was he was the young beach bum in that. He was in Pee Wee's uh, Big Adventure for a scene. He's the one who stole Pee Wee's bike uh, for Francis. Anyways, oh. <laughs> anyways, I've been trying to get in touch with him for a long time, and he has not like. I, I don't think he's even read my Facebook message, and he's he 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 left acting. A while ago, but he did so many movies in the '80s that it's it, it's insane. That it would be great to talk to him, you know. Like he's he's like one bucket list interview I would love to get, and I hope I do eventually. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think probably one of the most obscure uh, interviews that I did was with Kristen Graziano. Mm -hmm. She was the high school student. I, I don't know if she was the freshman or uh, she, she was either a freshman or a sophomore at Shermer High School in Fer Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah. And she was the the young girl who whom the freshman yeah. guy hands the phone to and says, hey, it's Ferris Bueller. And she talks to him and she says, yeah. hey, Ferris, how's your bod? You know, that's one of the, mm -hmm. you know, memorable lines from the film. And it, it was delivered by her. Mm -hmm. And I... I just so happened to find her uh, just by searching for her name on, you know, on some uh, white page directories. And, uh, you know, she was kind of taken aback when I called her. Yeah. And, and, you know, I said, w were you in Ferris Bueller's Day Off? And she was like, e yeah. <laughs> and uh, we talked for a few minutes and she, she got really excited because nobody ever asked her for an interview. Wow. Nobody. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to kind of have an exclusive there on the 35th anniversary of Paris Bueller's Day Off with her, and, and I interviewed a couple of other uh, actresses in the film as well. But yeah, she you, was a lot of fun. You had Stephanie Blake. I uh, I talked to her this year. Uh, didn't even know that she was on Facebook last year, but for the 35th of Ferris Bueller's, I talked to Polly Noonan, who's that nerd girl on the bus at the end with the gummy bears. I found her on LinkedIn uh, by, after trying to get in touch with her on Facebook. She didn't uh, get back to me on Facebook, but she got back to me on LinkedIn. Uh, we had a fun hour-long conversation, and we laughed and just had a great time. You know, she came up in the Chicago theater scene with John Cusack and Jeremy Piven. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. I enjoyed talking to her. And uh, I talked to the the snooty major D recently, Jonathan Schmock. So I had two. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I had two belated 35th anniversary Ferris Bueller interviews this year. Um, uh, Katie Barberi, who's the annoyed girl in the classroom, and she was Tangerine in the Garbage Pail Kids movie. Uh, she's been on here three times, and she's a good friend of mine, and she's a lot of fun. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, I remember her. Yeah, I have a, I have a, a podcast friend up in Canada named Greg Gilbert. Uh, he and I help each other get guests all the time, and he's done some exclusives um, 
with 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 eighties movie people. Uh, some I've interviewed as well, and then some I would only dream of getting. Like he talked to Michelle Mayrink, uh, you know, from Revenge of the Nerds and Valley Girl, a real genius. Yeah, yeah. Yep. he told me she was very nice, but she was like the first difficult guest he had because. I, because at the time he was doing his podcast at a radio station, um, and then when lockdown happened, he he does it on Zoom now in his own home. But he was doing it at a station at the time, and she was really insecure about how old her voice sounded, you know. And her voice sounds exactly the same as it did in the eighties; it hasn't changed. And if you listen to that interview, you can hear edits because she was just like, "Oh my God, are people going to hear me? Are people going to hear this?" You know. Real, real insecurity, and um, I, I reached out to her, and um, I never heard back. But I'm going to try again, though. I hope she doesn't do that to me. <laughs> I hope she's in a better place now than she was at that time. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like her a lot. She's she was in Real Genius too. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, thank goodness for editing. Uh, there, there's been some interviews where the guest, after I would. Yeah. You know, pose a, a question to them or try to encourage them to talk about something. They'll they'll sit there for maybe twenty, thirty seconds and not say anything. <laughs> I uh, yeah. And you know, I can edit all that out and make it sound a little, you know, make it sound like it flowed a little better. Um, I do that yeah, now. I, I, I do that now. I didn't do that for a long time. I started editing that those dead spaces a little bit more. Um, yeah, I don't edit for the most part unless uh, somebody uh, regrets saying something, you know. But for the most part, I keep sure. I keep everything in, you know. But uh, you know, just recently I talked to Gina Shock of the Go Go's, and she asked me to cut a couple things, including something that was hilarious. She she got so frustrated trying to figure out the name of Jimmy Iovine's record company, she cursed up a storm for like a minute, and it was one of the funniest things I have ever heard in my life. And <laughs> she told me to to edit that part out, and I. I have I have the released copy of the interview and I have my own personal copy so I can go listen to that and laugh out loud at it. Yeah, and of course now you're you're telling everybody that that happened. So <laughs> <laughs> on this interview, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I I told um, I told a friend of hers uh, recently that too, and he was la- he was laughing, you know, and you know, most likely she did she probably doesn't remember it because she does so many interviews. So. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. I mean, uh, you you talked to Sonny recently, you know, and you know I talked to him last year, and he's a nice guy, even though he has very little to say about his career. And you had Dan Shore on. That guy is such a trip. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He's he's really hoping to get the phone call for the the third Tron film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you mentioned uh, Melody Anderson. Yeah, I talked to her a couple of years ago. It spent like I spent like a year trying to get her. And when I did, she she told me right at the beginning, I only have thirty minutes, and I'm like, oh god. And so she was giving me like long answers to questions, and like I got the bulk of what I wanted though, but there was a lot more that I wanted. And then I tried to get her back, and it, she's really hit and miss with email. So. You know, maybe that'll that's maybe that's the only time I'll get her. But um, she was nice to me, though. Um, Linda McClure, yeah, you you talked to her. I talked to her uh, recently too. I talked to her back in March or April, somewhere around there. She came on here to declare her love for Bert and Hal and her disdain for Sally. <laughs> uh, she pretty much did the same thing on my show. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tom G. Waits, that guy's a force of nature, but he's cool. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not a big horror fan. I'm, I'm not mm-hmm. as big of a horror fan as you are, but I do like yeah. The Thing. Uh, that's one of my favorite films from the 80s, and I, and I like, you know, a, the Alien franchise. And uh, I'm, not, not so, I'm not so much a big fan of these horror films that demonstrate how depraved human beings can be like mm-hmm. the last house on the left and you know i spit on your grave and things like that <laughs> yeah uh, if if there's a monster or an alien involved you know some, something mm-hmm. that's not human that's doing the or even a mutant mm-hmm. you know even a even a human being that's been it's mutated because of 
some, you know, plague or, or because, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> gamma radiation or whatever, um, you know, I, I'm more open to that. But when you, when, when the filmmaker is, is trying to display, you know, just the depths of the human psyche and how people can crack and, and just become mass murderers because they, you know, because of something that happened in their childhood or something like that. I, mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of of those types of horror films, but... That's good. Um, it's, it, anyway. I get it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's subjective, you know. Uh, are there any that you want to explore for this ha- Halloween season that you're going to reach out to? Uh, well, ha- this October is actually the 60th anniversary of the James Bond franchise. So, mm. uh, the, the Dr. No was the first film, the first James Bond film that... That's my uh, favorite, actually. ...that was released, and it was October of 62. Yes. So I'm kind of doing... Uh, and, and uh, Yeah, I know that James Bond's not a horror, but where I'm going yeah. with this is that I was more so focusing on that because I've gotten a couple of... Uh, I've gotten a couple of interviews that are in line with the James Bond franchise. And uh, I, I might do a horror interview. Uh, the In November, the 45th anniversary of Close Encounters of the Third Kind is coming up, and I have one or two interviews uh, lined up for that. Oh. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, for, um, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll have to take a look at what anniversaries are occurring in, uh, this October and see if, if there would be one that would fit. I let's see. Interesting. Mm, go ahead. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I lost my train of thought. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to back up for a second. It's interesting that, you know, we were talking about editing and, and how it, it's great that we're able to, you know, edit things out. Yeah. I actually published a couple of episodes last, well, actually at the beginning of this year. Uh-huh. Uh, episodes 86 and 87, I believe, of Retrozest, I actually included outtakes from interviews. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there were one or two where we were having technical difficulties with the Zoom call. Yeah. And we had to, and either there was a delay with the interview or, uh, in other words, when I, would, when I would say something to the interviewee, they wouldn't respond for several seconds because there was a, a delay. Yeah. And then there were a couple of times where they just cut out altogether and I had to, we had to reestablish the zoom call and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And, and in the case of, uh, Jean Louisa Kelly, who was, uh, in uncle Buck, uh, uncle Buck. And also most recently in Top Gun Maverick, she was Iceman's wife in Top Gun Maverick. Right. She, uh, we didn't get, all of the interview done within the time frame that she had available at that day. And so she, she offered to allow me to reconnect with her later in the day. So we had mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, do a part two late in the afternoon. And I just basically edited everything together. And it, I mean, you would never know it listening to the episode, but I put those outtakes in those, uh, those two episodes, 86 and 87. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't done the outtakes thing. I know people who do. Mark Marin does it on WTF, and uh, he does it uh, uh, on the Paywall app, and um, I have access to the Paywall app, so um, I've heard uh, some of them here and there. Um, but yeah, as far as James Bond guests go, I mean, I talked to Bruce Glover for Diamonds Are Forever. Right. I talked to him. If you ever talk to him, uh, make sure make sure uh, you have a couple hours to spare because he will talk for a long time. Uh, uh, Greg, who I mentioned before, he talked to him for approximately three hours um, uh, years ago, and then did a, a ninety minute one with him like like a year or two later. And mine was 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 ninety minutes um, when I talked to him last year. Greg, who? Oh, Greg Gilbert, that podcast host I was telling you about. Oh, I see. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And yeah, then... I, I actually did reach out to Bruce Glover uh, mm-hmm. because his his email address is actually listed in IMDB Pro. Yeah. 
and uh, I, I reached out to him just before the 50th anniversary of Diamonds Are Forever, mm -hmm. and he, I asked if he would uh, you know, considered doing an interview, and he said yes. He says, but not right now. I'm very, very busy. Yeah. And this was maybe the the anniversary was December of 2021, I think, because it was 19 December of 1971 is when the film came out. And he, uh, th this was maybe three months before I was trying to get a jump on it. You know, mm -hmm. and. He, he, you know, he basically said, yeah, yes, I'll, I'll be happy to, but I can't do it right now. I'm very busy. Yeah. So I, I followed up with him a few times and, and never heard anything back. However, I did get a hold of his partner in crime, though, uh, huh. Utter Smith. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say Steve Joyner, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, Utter Smith was uh, Mr. Kidd mm -hmm. and in, in Diamonds Are Forever, and Bruce Glover was... Uh, Mr. Went, mm -hmm. they were the, the assassin team. So yeah, yeah Putter Smith's one of the interviews I, I'm, that I'm going to be airing in October. Nice, nice. So, yeah, yeah, he's he's a, uh, Putter's a great guy. He's a jazz musician too. He plays the bass. Nice. But uh, yeah, but, uh, Glor incidentally, you know who you know who Bruce Glover's son is. I, I, t I take it. Yeah, Crispin Glover, George McFly, and Back to the Future. Yep. Yeah, but you can tell. You can tell yeah. when you look at their faces. They they look a lot alike. So, yeah, it was it, it was great talking to him. Um, he he. I remember the first two movies I asked him about were were bad movies. CC and Company and this Frankenstein creature feature movie he did his very first movie and then you know he's like why are you asking me about the bad ones and i'm like i'm gonna ask you about the good ones you know diamonds are forever and walking tall and uh chinatown and hard times you know we, we got into all of that i wanted to ask him about working with jim winorski on uh, big bad mama but i could see he was getting tired you know he's 90 years old so we stopped yeah, yeah he's he's up there yeah <laughs> yeah uh, Gloria Hendry, she was in black exploitation movies in the 70s. She was in Live and Let Die. Um, she's been trying to make time to come on here. She's got some personal things going on, but hopefully I'm going to make that happen as far as James Bond movies go. I tried to get Natalie Wood's sister, Lana Wood, from Diamonds Are Forever on here, um, but uh, she never, um, I don't think she saw my message, but we shall yeah. see. Yeah. yeah I, I, I actually, in. in since I couldn't get Bruce Glover for the Diamonds Are Forever episode, I ended up getting Trina Parks, Trina who Parks. was uh, the, the black woman at, you know, she played Thumper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were Bambi and Thumper. You remember the bodyguards of uh, the people that were right. the, the two ladies that were guarding, um, I almost said Howard Hughes, um, uh, Willard White <laughs> yeah. uh, was the, uh, you know, was the, the mystery uh, um, character in Diamonds Are Forever for much of the movie, and he was played by uh, Jimmy Dean. But, um, uh, but yes, uh, it turns out Trina, she lives here in Atlanta, uh, close to me, and she was actually the first black Bond girl. And uh, a lot of... Uh, you know, people were telling her that at the time, and there really wasn't a whole lot of fanfare about that back in the day. Yeah. Um, but you know, she's she's proud to be able to <laughs> when she did the bumper for for uh, did the did a bumper for me for the show. She introduced herself as you know the first black Bond girl, Trina Parks. So. Huh. I should reach out to her. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's a lot of fun. Nice. Uh, have you have you have you had any people that you reached out to say say oh yeah but oh yeah I'll I'll do the interview but you gotta pay me. Oh yeah, there's there's been a <laughs> few of those. Trina was one of those, and uh, uh, Julian Glover was the other one. And I I really wanted uh, Julian on the show, so I was I was willing to to pay. I had to go through his you know agency or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I did pay for that. I didn't pay what they were asking. I, I, I offered lower and they kind of met me, you know, mm -hmm. just under half, just under halfway. So 
I haven't, I, I've been so lucky, I haven't been able to do that, but um, I've had a couple people uh, do that with me, including one that just, oh my god, I couldn't believe it. So, I tried to get, um, what's her name, Tammy Aaron, who played Pippi Longstocking in the 80s on here, in 2018, when I was just beginning, you know, I'd been doing it a year at the time, and um, we were, uh, we were all, you know, set, we were all, you know, set to do it, and we were going to talk an hour, we agreed on that, and um, the day before, or maybe the day of, I can't remember, she uh, messages me, and she tells me that she uh, she has something that came up, and she said, we'll do it, but right now I got something that came up, and I said, okay, and then a month went by, and I didn't hear from her, and then finally I did, and she says to me, and I quote, I'll give you 20 min I'll give you 20 minutes for $400. And I replied her back saying, "You are out of your fucking mind." And she blocked oh me on God. and she blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> and then I did something. I've only done this with two people. The the other person, I didn't even have my podcast yet. I called her out on her Facebook fan page and then got blocked from that. I was just so disgusted that she did that, you know? Mm. Well, it almost kind of sounded like she that she might have changed her mind, and she yeah. might have felt that would have been a more graceful way of blowing you off. But uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that's bizarre. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's that's the only real time and stuff. Generally, I have found though when when they usually uh, say that they want money, that's usually their way of saying you're, you're an amateur. Go away, kid. <laughs> you know, or something like that, you know, but when you're doing the, the agent manager thing, yeah, like, you know, like you were just saying about Julian Glover, I guess that, that's what happens at times, though, but I haven't, I haven't had that, you know, knock wood, and, you know, I don't monetize the show, I do the show because I'm passionate about what I do, you know? Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, another one, too. I tried to get Rhonda Fultz from In Cold Blood. I wanted an In Cold Blood guest so bad. There's only two people left, Rhonda Fultz and Brenda Curran. And Rhonda Fultz, she wanted money, and she she came off kind of crazy in email. So then I was just like, I don't want to deal with this. So then a mutual friend put me in touch with Brenda Curran, and she almost said no because she thought that I was going to ask about the time that she spent with... Um, the real girl that she's playing in the movie, the of, of the family that got killed, you know, and I was like, I I have no interest in asking about that. I want to talk about you and your experience, you know. So she came on, you know, we talked, you know, eighty five minutes, and about a good forty minutes of that conversation was about in cold blood, and it was wonderful. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, who's on your bucket list that you really, really want? Oh, dear Lord. Uh, I may have to think about that for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to have... I mean, I'd love to interview Richard Dreyfus, but uh, <laughs> I, I, that might be a bit of a pipe dream. I don't know. But... Um, because I'm a big, you know, big, big Close Encounters and a big Jaws fan. I love everything uh, you did. <laughs> Again. I love everything that Richard Dreyfus did. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a really good actor. Good, he, good, the Good My Girl. He was in that. Mm -hmm. um, the Stakeout movies <laughs> <laughs> with with Emilio Estevez. Whatever happened to Emilio Estevez? I, I, he's he's one I'd like to interview. You don't hear much from him anymore. He uh, he's been doing like you know um, activism causes. You know he's in, he's into that like his father is. Um, Beatrice Bopley, who played Amanda Kruger in Nightmare on Elm Street 5, is a friend of mine, and she's uh, in touch with him, you know, because they did Stakeout together. You know, she was his wife in that movie. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. So he's doing just activism these days. You know, he directed that movie about about Robert Kennedy back in 06. That's like, I, that's like the only major thing he's done since. Yeah, yeah. Another one I'd really like to get is, you know, his Breakfast Club co-star, Molly Ringwald. Yeah. Yeah. She'd be, yeah, she'd she, be great. You know, she's, she's still around. You see her every so often. 
oh, of course. up in something. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've I've attractive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my brother had a huge crush on her. And my brother also had a crush on Samantha Mathis, and like we met her at a convention, and he told her he's like he's like I had a crush on you right after Molly Ringwald, and she said, "Oh, everybody had a crush on Molly Ringwald." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'd like to get you know a couple people you've had like Jay Underwood. I've been trying to get in touch with him. Uh, Fee Way Bill of the Tubes. I met him at a um, concert that he did at Santa Cruz back in 2016. And he, he's the complete opposite of what you see on stage, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he, yeah. He, I actually interviewed him when I was attempting to get an interview with somebody from Loverboy. I, I was trying to get Mike Reno. Yeah. And the, the, the same firm that manages uh, the Tubes also manages Loverboy. And at the time that, you know, this was, this was around the time of the anniversary of Get Lucky, the Get Lucky album by Loverboy. And none of the band members were available for an interview at that time. And I was talking to the guy's name is Tom at the, at the managing firm. And he said, mm-hmm. yeah, none of, none of Loverboy's available right now. He says, but I can give you fee way bill. Yeah. And so I, I kind of got him by accident, and I was like, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and as it turned out, uh, uh, the completion, Backward Principle, I think was, was the album. Yes. Uh, the Tubes album that it, it had celebrated a 40th anniversary earlier in the year. So <laughs> we were able to, to talk some about that. But we, we talked about, you know, pretty much the entirety of his career, and he... Yeah. Um, he... You know, he, he had a new album that just came out that Richard Marks helped him yeah. put together. And uh, he, he was another one that we had to break into two parts. He ran out of time and we had to reconvene on like two days later. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, that was actually a telephone interview. Uh, most, of mm-hmm. a, most of the interviews I do are on um, either on Zoom. And I, I've started to use this uh, platform called Riverside. FM because it's a little bit the quality is the quality is a little better and they don't limit you at to forty minutes. Um, but anyway, in Fee Wiggle's case, he 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 doesn't do Zoom or anything like that, so he he just preferred to do a telephone interview. And mm-hmm. it's interesting because the first part of the interview we did uh, sounds one way, and the second part sounds a little bit different because I guess because of the quality of the phone call Mm -hmm. so you can even though I edited everything together you can you can kind of tell there's a slight difference once one part of the interview comes up but uh, it's I mean it's not too terribly noticeable but uh, but you know it's just you know Mm -hmm. first first world problems you know (laughs) yeah Are there any movies or albums uh, that you want to celebrate the the anniversary of next year that's on your list? Uh, War Games uh, is going to be celebrating a 40th next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd be interested to... I'm I'm looking into doing uh, an episode about that. I'd love love to get Ali Sheedy for that. Yeah. Um, uh, But there's some other... You know, there's some other more obscure actors in that film that might be more accessible. Uh, one of my guilty pleasures is celebrating a 40th anniversary next year, Lone Wolf McQuaid. Oh, yeah. If you ever saw that. Oh, yeah, I like that movie. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of the precursor to Walker, Texas Ranger. And, uh, in fact, I think there was some kind of a lawsuit that took place when Walker, Texas Ranger came out because oh, I... the filmmakers mm-hmm. were like, Hey, this is just like Lone Wolf McQuaid. What are you doing? You know. Yeah. And I think they originally wanted to call it McQuaid Texas Ranger, but they had to change it to Walker Texas Ranger. But anyway, the film. I wasn't a real big fan of the sh- of that show, but mm-hmm. but that film, yeah, I just <laughs> it's really cheesy. I mean, seeing David Carradine, you know, fight Chuck Norris in a 
cardigan sweater at the end and you know, yeah <laughs> it's it's just uh, and and with the the pipe organ music playing it's got like a real spaghetti western feel even though it's uh you know supposed to be present day or at least present day 1983 mm-hmm. and uh but yeah I, that was that's always been a guilty pleasure of mine i may just have to do a an episode to celebrate that yeah t- i want to <laughs> Yeah, talk to Steve Carver, uh, who directed it. I, I talked to him a couple of years ago. Um, men- mentioned to him, though, that you want to talk about his photography, and he'll most likely do it. He loves talking about his photography as much as he loves talking about his movies. Um, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was great. He's a character. You know, He directed Big Bad Mama and Jocks and a couple other things. Yeah, Steve Carver is a, is a good one. Yeah, for me, I'd, for next year, I'd like I'd like to get someone from the Big Chill. Um, I I haven't had anyone on from that. Uh, Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. I heard that uh, Deborah Pratt is on Facebook. I may reach out to her. Uh, I want to get someone from Kroll. I haven't been able to get anyone from that. And um, oh, Ken Marshall, yeah, yeah, Ken Marshall. I haven't even been able to find him. Uh, I found out a teenager from the original Blob from 1958 is uh, is a, a writer and teaches writing classes online. Let me reach out to him. Uh, Faye Ray's um, daughter uh, wrote a, a book about her mother. Uh, I'll reach out to her for King Kong's 90th. Um, David Mosco from Big, who played young Tom Hanks in it, I'd like to reach out to him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I want to get some. I want to get some more people from Animal House on here. Um, that's that one's been difficult. I, I got Catherine Wilson for the fortieth in uh, twenty eighteen. She was the uh, locations um, uh, person for it. Uh, she is a wonderful person. I recommend her. Um, she's friends with the whole cast, and um, she has great stories about them. And uh, I heard Karen Allen has a. Um, has a store that she owns in Boston, and there's a uh, there's an email on the website. So I'm going to see if I can get Karen Allen on here. Yeah, I I tried to get Karen for the 40th anniversary of Raiders, mm-hmm. and uh, I ended up talking. She has some kind of a store, a clothing yeah brand or something. I, I can't remember what it was, but I tried to reach out to her there and uh, somebody responded back and said, this is not Karen's email <laughs> or something like that. And, oh God. Uh, but, but, and then they went on to say that she's very busy doing, you know, other interviews for the 40th anniversary of the film. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up getting the actor who played Fred- Chuck Lindsay for that episode. The Fred Sorensen. Helps Indy escape from the, Vetoes at the beginning of the film. Fred Sorensen, yeah, I reached out to him and I, I didn't hear back, but I listened to that interview. That was interesting. Yeah, he, he had a lot of great stories. I mean, he was really the only reason he was cast in the film was because he was a pilot. Mm-hmm. And he, he was already hired by the production to be a pilot. And uh, yeah, so they just said, well, well, you know, why don't you, why don't you, you know, just appear as one of the actors in the film too, you know, as yeah. the pilot. So that's what he did. I want to reach but, out. Uh, I, mm-hmm. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I want to reach out to Rudy Sarzo for the 40th anniversary of Quiet Riot's Metal Health. That was the first number one heavy metal record. Oh yeah, yeah. He he's all over Instagram and yeah. Twitter, and I mean, he's. It seems like he's kind of, you know risen from obscurity as of recent or something maybe maybe just i just haven't noticed him but he's he's out there now you, you see a lot of him um 83 uh, another big film in 83 would be return of the jedi oh and uh, there there's uh, some actors in that that are actually represented by the same company that represents julian glover yeah so i might i might see if i can uh, yeah, and I, I believe one of them was the actress who played Mon Mothma, one of the few women in the Star, the Star Fe- Wars franchise oh, yeah, oh, at that time. Oh yeah, so, um, this is Leia. Yeah, Femi Taylor. I've interviewed her. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Was she a lot of fun? Oh yeah. She. Um. You know. She's. 
Uh, she's got, you know, she's got uh, kind of, a, it's like an English accent, but it's also, she lives in Denmark, you know, and yeah, she is just a lot of fun. She's so person, personable and, and friendly. I'll tell you, the actress that they got to play the younger Mon Mothma in Rogue One mm. looks almost exactly like her. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was really, I mean, I don't know if they did any CGI with that or not. I, I don't remember reading anything about uh, her being CGI generated, but, you know, of course, Peter Cushing was, and uh, as was Carrie Fisher. Yeah, had, had I known that you uh, wanted to do a uh, Pink Floyd Mom Momentary Laughs of Reason interview, I would have <clears throat> put you in touch with the McBroom sisters. You know, they're the backup singers uh, for Pink Floyd on that tour and the uh, Division Bell tour. They got some hilarious stories about about going on tour with Pink Floyd. Oh, okay. Nice, nice. McBroom, you said? Yeah, Lorelai McB McBroom and Marsha... Uh, oh no, not Marsha. Uh, Durga McBroom. Durga, of course, was in uh, Flashdance, and she's uh, she was in uh, David Lee Ross Yankee Rose video. She's the black girl in the uh, convenience store at the beginning. And by the way, she was a little um, she was she was a little irritated. I brought I brought it up because she dated David Lee Roth at that time, and it wasn't a, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, I thought it was interesting. The, the guy I did interview for Momentary Laughs to Reason, Scott Page, mm -hmm. he, he uh, played on David Lee Roth's Diamond Dave album. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and he, uh, so uh, it was just kind of interesting that mm -hmm. <laughs> I was able to get somebody who's worked with both Pink Floyd and 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 Dave, you know, not not Van Halen, but, but David Lee Roth. Yeah. But uh, you, you don't usually see those two mm -hmm. um you know, things on a person's resume. Yeah. How long have you been going to conventions for? Oh, man. I, 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 since, like, the 80s. I mean, mm. for a long time I didn't go to any. But, uh, you know, 86, 87, 88, I went, I, I used to go to the Atlanta Fantasy Fair. And uh, Dragon Con, I believe, started around 88. And I, 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 I didn't really attend Dragon Con until like around 2010. I started going to the parade that they had uh, every Saturday morning. They would have a dra Dragon Con parade. And even if you didn't buy tickets for Dragon Con, you could watch the parade. You just have to go downtown and, you know, wait, you know, just stand there for a couple of hours, find your place to, to where you're, so that you're able to see when everybody walks past, but, uh, you know, I, w I would take my son to that. Uh, I, actually, I think the neighbors invited us to go. So we did that, and, and then I started going to Dragon Con maybe around 2014 or 2015. And, um, you know, I've been to a few other conventions. Uh, Atlanta had a comic con back in 2009, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been to a Star Trek convention or two. Mm -hmm. um, and not not the big one in Vegas, but you know, just a local one. There's one in the Atlanta area called Trek Tracks that occurs every year, and it's mostly it mostly centers around uh, tr Star Trek fan film yeah. creators. And you'll go there, and uh, the, the booths that are at the convention are mostly production, you mm -hmm. know, small production companies who make Star Trek fan films. But there's a few like artists and vendors that are selling patches and T-shirts and things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've been yeah, I've been going to conventions, you know, since since the '80s. But I took a you know a long break from it for a while and and just but but yeah, started back around 2008 2009. I started in 2016. I'd been wanting to go to them my whole life, but. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents didn't like horror. They still don't. And I had to suffer the consequences of that. And plus, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of conventions back then except for Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors. Um, they would come to, to San Jose. You know, I'm from San Mateo. And they'd come to San Jose to do it. And that was about it. And I realized in 2016 that, you know, I want to I want to meet all these celebrities and stuff. And so I started going to them. And I was hooked. I went on 
you know, I went to so many of them in 2016 and 17, you know, following my car crash that I had in, in 2015. And I've, I've made so many friends uh, with celebrities and had guests on, you know. Um, I hadn't met Diane yet, as I said, but I became friends with Catherine Mary Stewart. She was my second guest, and she's been on five times, I think, by now. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, Catherine Mary Stewart, of course, Kelly Maroney, um, God, so many people. And, yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot about conventions I don't like, um, behind-the-scenes stories I hear, you know, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get in to host panels at conventions, but that's been really tough. I was supposed to host one last year at a Comic-Con, a Comic-Con which, by the way, booked uh, Gina Shock recently because of me, because uh, because I know them, because I know the, uh, the promoters. I was supposed to host a panel for them, but I had to back out because my mom had surgery uh, that week. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I love going to conventions. I went to one last month, um, a little Comic Con uh, or a horror con, I should say, and um, I got to meet Frank Dietz and uh, Mark Dodson, who did the voices uh, for Grem for Gremlins and uh, George Romero's Day of the Dead zombies and stuff, and uh, my friend Beverly Washburn, who was the little girl in Old Yeller, uh, got to see her, and. Yeah, conventions are a lot of fun. They can be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. How many? How many? I'll have to. Mm -hmm. I missed Dragon Con this year, but I may have to bite the bullet and go next year. How, how many eighties in the stands have you been to? I've been to every one. Uh, this will be my fifth uh, this year. Uh, end of end of October will be my fifth, and I actually co-host. 80s trivia and 80s music bingo with nice. my friend Dale Shoemaker mm -hmm. at 80s in the Sand, and we yeah, that's a lot of fun. We do like three or four sessions during the week, and you know some people don't go to it because it's it's not outside, and a lot of people would rather be at the pool and that type of thing. But we get we usually get a pretty good crowd, and we have a lot of great prizes that we. Uh, giveaway. I'm always <laughs> Dale and I both are always accumulating prizes throughout the year. In between the sands, you know, we, we'll find something that's uh, you know really neat at a at a store or whatever, and uh, you know something '80s related or retro related, and we we kind of have a cache of prizes. A lot of stuff we just give away. Like I I usually buy a bunch of uh, socks, you know, socks with um, uh, like horror theme socks like with uh, Freddy Krueger on them or um, uh, you know Jason or whatever and then there's some with you know I had a pair of some Fast Times at Ridgemont High socks and um, you know other you know Jaws things of that nature and a lot of those we just when, when we start the sessions I'll just come out <clears throat> and just start throwing them into the into the audience you know <laughs> just, yeah. just start you know just do, doing giveaways you know and uh, but then when you know somebody buddy actually wins the competition, they they get you know a, a bigger prize. Yeah, uh, I, when I interviewed Bob Romanus um, in 2019, he was on his way to 80s in the Sand. He was at the airport. Uh, he was on his way to the airport in LA traffic. We talked for 30 minutes. I mean, that was just awesome that he that he did that because he was on his way to the airport. And yeah, I mean. I, I, Diane and, and Julia Montgomery, they go, they love it. You know, I, I'm always talking with them about it. And, you know, I'd like to go someday, but God, uh, it'd be expensive uh, for me to go. But someday I, I will. I mean, they got all the 80s bands that I like doing it, you know. And, um, yeah, Deborah Foreman was involved with it for like a minute. And then she she stopped doing it mysteriously. And she's a strange person. I've, I, I, me and people I know have had weird encounters with Deborah Foreman. Yeah, yeah. She, yeah, from Valley Girl, yeah. Yeah, would you, would you do a Valley Girl uh, interview next year? Yeah, I guess that, that, that anniversary's coming up too, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I would. It'd, it'd be cool to get Nick Cage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I, uh, but yeah, I mean, she, she probably, probably would be the easier get for that. Heidi, she uh, was in Real, Real Genius also. 
yeah, Heidi Holliker, I recommend. Um, she would be great. Uh, Joyce Heiser, who's in just one of the guys, she's in Valley Girl at like at the end at, at the dance. She's great too. Um, and EG Daly's in it. EG Daly, I tried getting EG. I met her at a convention. She was so good to me, you know. But uh, she's like not responsive. Uh, and she did respond to one tweet I sent her a couple of years ago, and she's saying that she wasn't doing any interviews at the moment. But I hope to get her someday. Her and I would have a blast. I heard her sense of humor is very body behind the scenes, and my sense of humor is very body. That's why I get along with all these actresses, and why we have you know friendships away from the podcast because we're like minded, you know. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's just wonderful. Yeah, my next interview uh, later today is George Figs uh, from uh, Pink Flamingos, the John Waters movies. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the 50th anniversary, yeah, so I'm going to be talking to him. But I will give a listen to your Pink Floyd interview later today, and I know I'm going to enjoy it because I enjoy a lot of the stuff that you do. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today, Curtis. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wish you nothing but all the success in the world with your show, and uh, you, you've got a great show, and you, like I said, you're more... Uh, obscure than I am with <laughs> some of the some of your guests, and uh, it's you know you, you 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 never seem to have a shortage of uh, interviews, so that's that's a good thing. So keep up the good work. Uh, oh, thank you, absolutely. Wait till you see what I got in October coming. I I talk to really obscure horror movie people every October, like a slam bam of it all month long, you know, because I started you know breaking away from d talking to just horror people, you know, a couple of years ago, and then every October since, you know, I've just had like a whole month long, you know, you know, fest of um, horror people in the month of October. So it's going to get even more obscure. And I thank you for coming on, Curtis, and I hope you have a great day and stay safe out there. All right. You too, my friend. God bless. God bless. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Curtis Lanklo. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy, huh? And, yeah, check out his podcast, Retro Zest. You know, there's a website, and it's available on Spotify, which is where I primarily listen to. He's really passionate about what he does. And that was a great conversation we had today. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes.